Chapter 4 The Drainage Canal The second month of the prison camp's existence opens with a list of about 4,500 prisoners, enough to comfortably fill the barracks. During the month, 5,195 prisoners arrive and the prison is congested. The entire camp not occupied with buildings is covered with tents. The prisoners poured in so rapidly that it was utterly impossible to keep pace with the rapidly increasing demands made in every direction. While hospital buildings were being rushed as fast as possible, the enfeebled prisoners became sick so fast that adequate care could not be given, much as everyone desired to do it. A calm and reasonable consideration of the facts gives the best answer to the unreasonable charges made on all sides by the South that the effort was not made to properly care for the prisoners. The following official communication explains conditions at the beginning of August. Headquarters Draft Rendezvous, Elmira, New York, August 3, 1864. Brigadier General L. Thomas, Adjutant General, USA, Washington, D.C. General, since my last report, I have the honor to state that 5,000 prisoners of war have arrived at this depot and are quartered in barracks and tents at barracks number three. All recruits, substitutes, and drafted men have been transferred to barracks number one, excepting deserters who are confined in the guardhouse. The latter will be transferred as soon as the guardhouse is completed at barracks number one. The 54th Regiment New York Militia, numbering about 350, arrived here on the 27th of July to serve as guard over prisoners of war. This regiment, with the six companies of the 16th VRC, furnished about 700 men for guard duty at the prisoners' camp. At barracks number one, there are 200 colored drafted men and substitutes, organized into two companies, armed and equipped, doing guard duty there. Thirty of these are detailed daily as a patrol guard inside the enclosure at prisoners' camp. I have just received notice from Major General Dix that two more regiments of militia from New York City will be ordered here for duty, and it is probable that they will arrive here tonight or tomorrow. Owing to the number of troops to arrive here suddenly, it became necessary to direct the quartermaster to lease some ground next to the prisoners' camp for an encampment, which I respectfully request may be approved. The new hospital is completed and occupied. The general condition of this post is excellent. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel, USA, Commanding Post. The continued arrival of prisoners swelled the number so greatly that Colonel Eastman began to get nervous because the guard was so small. He made a telegraphic appeal for reinforcements. Two batteries of artillery, A and B of the 1st Battalion Light Artillery, NYNG, arrived on August 3rd from Rochester, 66 men and four guns. The 77th and 98th Regiments State Militia also arrived. Plate number 12 shows the artillery camp on the right and the 54th New York Militia on the left. The camp was on the south side of Water Street, west of the enclosure. On the 16th of August, the force guarding prisoners consisted of the 28th, 54th, 56th, 58th, 77th, 98th, 99th, and 102nd Regiments of New York Militia. Batteries A and B, 1st Battalion New York Light Artillery, and six companies of the 16th VRC. In addition to the new hospital, which is mentioned in Colonel Eastman's report as being completed, three additional hospital buildings are being constructed. All the work is being done by the prisoners. The demand for hospital accommodations is greater than can be supplied. During this period of five weeks from the opening of the camp, Surgeon Wei had done his best to care for the prison camp in addition to his regular duties in connection with the post hospitals. Notwithstanding the urgent need of a surgeon in the camp, it was August 8th before anything was done. On that day, Surgeon Wei was relieved and Surgeon Eugene Sanger, USA, assigned to duty as surgeon of the camp. On the same day, Assistant Surgeons Chas E. Ryder and C.S. Bailey were detailed as assistants. On August 12th, Assistant Surgeon John T. Parker was added to the staff and on the 14th, Assistant Surgeons F.D. Ritter and Henry J. Rogers reported for duty. William C. Way was born at Catskill, New York, January 12, 1829. 
He was a medical student under Dr. Alden March, one of the most famous surgeons of his day, and graduated from the Albany Medical College on January 23, 1849. He located at Elmira in the spring of the same year. He soon acquired a surgical reputation and went long distances to perform difficult operations. In his early career, he served as coroner of Shimung County, and when Elmira became a city in 1864, he was the first health officer, and again in 1894 he was appointed health officer, but failing health caused him to relinquish the office. He was a member of the Board of Education for six years. In 1875, he was appointed by Governor Tilden, a member of the Board of Managers of the New York State Reformatory, and served continuously over 22 years till his death. He was a manager and senior consulting physician of the Arna Ogden Memorial Hospital, and the last time he left his house, two weeks before his death, he was to attend a meeting of the hospital managers. Dr. Way was president of the Medical Society of the State of New York in 1871. He was chosen president of the State Medical Examining and Licensing Board at its first meeting, September 1, 1891, and occupied the position till his death, which occurred June 30, 1897. Early in the war, Dr. Way was appointed an examiner of recruits. Later, he was commissioned acting assistant surgeon USA and became surgeon in charge of the military hospitals of the post at Elmira. His induction into the prison camp and the heroic work he did there is outlined in Chapter 3. This brief sketch of his life finds a place here as an act of simple justice to Elmira. Owing to the severe criticism made concerning his first real service in the prison camp, in the interest of humanity, this self-sacrificing Christian hero left all his other duties and devoted his entire time and strength to the relief of the suffering victims of the terrible railroad wreck with no thought as to whether they were friends or foes. To him, they were suffering human beings, needing his quickest and best skill, and they got everything which his overtaxed strength could give. He made his own house a hospital supply station, the quicker to get what he so much needed. And after all this, he still carried the burden of the prison hospital, with its rapidly increasing list of patients for nearly a month till finally the government on August 8th provided a surgeon and five assistant surgeons to do the work which Surgeon Way had been doing for a month with almost no help, in addition to all his other duties in the U.S. hospitals and elsewhere. The fact is that the strain was so great that he was obliged soon after to give up entirely his position as surgeon of the post hospitals. Forty-seven years of faithful, conscientious work in the city of Elmira, both before and after the war, and the important honors bestowed on him not only by his home city but by the state, go to show that Dr. Way was a surgeon of great ability, and as such not deserving the criticism of anyone for the splendid work he did. He was a man possessed of great dignity of character, rare courtliness of manner, and a representative of all that goes to make up the best type of nature's nobleman. He was a man of extreme modesty, and the general public had little knowledge of his extensive acts of charity, unless revealed by the recipient. Therefore, the perfect record of his many deeds of kindness can only be found in the Book of Life. His life, while not long, was full to repletion with deeds of service to the Master and loving kindness to suffering humanity, and he left a name and memory which will be cherished by posterity is that of one of Almira's noblest and most prominent citizens. The following letter brings out a side of Dr. Way's personality which strengthens the assertions made. The allusion in the opening sentence refers to the main letter sent before, which appears later. The Ridgewood, 83 Ridgewood Ave, Newark, New Jersey, March 18, 1912. My dear Mr. Holmes, I have done nothing more yet than merely mention the name of Dr. Way. It seems to me only right that I should speak a little more at length of one who was my dear and honored friend. There was a distant connection between us. One of his sisters married a cousin of my mother, and I think it must have been through that sister that he learned of my presence in Elmira. At any rate, it was very shortly after my arrival there that he put himself into communication with me. I have forgotten whether he wrote me or came to see me at the barracks. I think it was the latter. He asked me to spend the next Sunday at his home, taking dinner with him and staying the afternoon. 
the invitation was repeated, and it soon became an almost regular thing for me to dine with them on Sunday and stay the afternoon. The doctor was a devout communicant of the Episcopal Church. Mrs. Way's parents had been Presbyterians, and she always retained a love for the church of her own early days. As I was a Presbyterian, she frequently asked me to come down early enough Sunday morning to go with her to the Presbyterian Church for the morning service. Then I would dine with them, and in the evening, when the doctor was at liberty, the three of us would go to the Episcopal Church. Altogether, the pleasantest recollections of my Elmira life are the Sundays I spent in the home of Dr. and Mrs. Way. In person, Dr. Way was short and stoutly built, and somewhat inclined to corpulency. His manners were those of the traditional gentlemen of the old school, formal, dignified, and, to first impressions, almost cold. But this last wore off as one came to know the heart of the man. His voice was low and gentle. I do not think I ever heard him raise it or speak in a loud tone. His laugh was rich and musical. It was as good as a feast to hear it and to see his eyes twinkle as he perpetuated some stroke of humor or wit or heard some comical story of the day's experience. In every way, he was a most delightful host. As a man, he was without reproach. His sense of honor was as high and delicate and stern as that of any man I have ever known. I cannot conceive it possible that he ever did an act that did not measure up to that standard. And to his standing and service as a physician, others can speak more intelligently than I. I have preferred to speak of him simply as a man, the friend whom I honored and loved, and who honored me by giving me his friendship. Very sincerely yours, Stephen G. Hopkins. Up to this point, it has been possible to mention facts with some relation to chronological order, but with the camp in full swing, it seems impossible to continue the effort. If when a topic is introduced, all information pertaining thereto be assembled, it will enable the reader to absorb more readily the complete story, and so that course will be followed. Early in August, the subject which loomed up hastily and urgently was that of drainage. Like the hospital question, it had received little thought in the beginning. But with a body of over 5,000 men to care for, and a temperature ranging around 90 degrees, with no rains and a general scarcity of water in the streams, the condition grew rapidly serious. The body of water within the enclosure, Foster's Pond, was really a stagnant pool, having no inlet for running water and no outlet. The sinks were first located on the bank, and all refuse of every kind, from the cookhouses and elsewhere, was deposited in their pond. Under the extreme weather conditions prevailing, it only took a few days to produce a condition offensive to the nostrils and dangerous to the health. The first mention made in the advertiser was July 26th. Quote, the stagnant pond hole back of barracks number three is to be improved by letting in a running stream of water through a ditch dug to the river. This arrangement will secure a constant accession of fresh water and relieve the deleterious miasma that would be otherwise unhealthful. Again on August 14th, quote, the suggestion of Colonel Eastman for introducing a running stream through the pond holes under the bluff at barracks number three has been made to Washington for their endorsement. Should the project be carried out, the river will be dammed a mile above and a stream conducted through a race starting above the dam and carried into the river again through the present outlet of the sluggish spring pond holes. The following is the official correspondence on the subject. Headquarters Depot Prisoners of War, Elmira, August 17, 1864. Colonel W. M. Hoffman, Commanding General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C. Colonel, I have the honor to report to you that the pond inside of the prisoners camp at barracks number three has become very offensive and may occasion sickness unless the evil is remedied very shortly. The only remedy for this is to dig a ditch from the pond to the river so that the water will run freely through it. I've given orders to have a survey made. The ditch will have to be about one mile in length. The only objection to this is that a freshet might do some damage to the land through which the ditch will run, and the owners will call on the United States for that. They have, however, no objection to having the ditch dug. I respectfully request that you will give the instructions in regard to this 
as little delay as possible, for if this work is to be done, it should be done immediately. I forward herewith a report of the surgeon on this matter. The sinks are removed from the pond, and large vaults have been dug in place of them. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel, USA, Commanding Post. Surgeon Sanger's report, which accompanies the letter, enters into a scientific explanation of cause and effect, discussing the value of disinfectants, and concludes with the statement that running water is the proper solution of the difficulty. On August 22nd, the advertiser says, quote, First cutting for canal of barracks number three has been made and a small stream of fresh water now flows through the stagnant pool at the foot of the terrace. End quote. There does not seem to be any direct evidence to substantiate this. Neither do the records show any reply to the letter of Colonel Eastman. The next reference found is an inspection report made September 25th by Captain Munger and Colonel Tracy, who endorses the same under date of September 30th as follows. Quote, drainage of the camp is not good. There is a pond of stagnant water in the center, which renders camp unhealthy. This can be remedied by bringing water from the river through the camp, end quote. The subject is more fully stated in the following communication. Headquarters Depot, Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York, October 17, 1864. Colonel W.M. Hoffman, Commissary General of Prisoners, Washington, D.C. Colonel. The continued prevalence of disease and death in this camp impels me to call the attention of the authorities to what is apparently the cause, to wit, the existence of a stagnant pond of water within the enclosure. Nothing else that I can see produces the large mortality among the prisoners. The camp is clean, water pure and abundant, and rations wholesome. The medical officers attribute the larger proportion of the sickness prevailing to the effects of this body of impure and malarial matter. The remedy for this evil, for such I conceive it to be, is attainable. A stream of water can be introduced from the river by digging a trench and laying pipe about 6,000 feet. The cost of wooden pipe of 6 inch diameter would be, as I learn upon inquiry, about 75 cents per foot. The digging and laying could be done principally with prison labor and at a small expense. I am informed that the estimated cost of laying pipe of this description is about 6,000 per mile. Your attention was first called to this almost intolerable nuisance in a letter from these headquarters dated August 17, 1864, recommending that a ditch be dug from the river and allowing a stream of fresh water to play through it. A telegram from you of date August 20th, 1864, requiring a report on the matter of introducing water into the camp from the city waterworks was answered August 21st, 1864. There then being made a full report in the matter, that it would be inexpedient to admit water from the city waterworks, as they failed to supply even to the inhabitants of the city through the summer and fall months. A survey had been made, a copy which was forwarded to you in letter of that date, of a ditch to be dug from the river. It seems to me that a due regard for the lives of the prisoners confined here requires that some method of introducing a running stream of water through this camp should be adopted. And in view of this, I respectfully request authority to have the ditch constructed and the pipe laid after the plan proposed in this communication. The owners of this land do not object to the blind ditch, but did to the open ditch as proposed by Lieutenant Colonel Eastman in letter of August 17, 1864. I am very respectfully your obedient servant, B.F. Tracy, Colonel, 127th U.S. Troops, Commanding Depot. Endorsed as follows, respectfully submitted to Major General Halleck, Chief of Staff, with the previous report of Lieutenant Colonel Eastman on the same subject. The excavation required can be done by the work of the prisoners at a trifling cost, and a pipe to be made of one inch boards with an opening six by six inches would probably cost less than $500, and of the two inch plank not over $1,000, and respectfully recommended that a pipe of two inch plank be laid the expense to be paid out of the prison fund. W. Hoffman, Colonel, 3rd Infantry and Commanding General of Prisoners. General Halleck approves verbally of the plan above suggested if it can be carried out. The following is the previous report referred to in the endorsement of Colonel Hoffman. 
Headquarters Depot for Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York, August 21st, 1864. Colonel W.M. Hoffman, Commanding General, Prisoners of War, Washington, D.C. Colonel, pursuant to your telegraphic order, I have the honor to forward you a copy of the survey made for the purpose of digging a ditch to let in water from the Shemung River to the pond inside the prisoners' camp. The only survey necessary to be made was to ascertain the elevation of the river above the pond and the depth that the ditch should be dug. The length of the ditch will be 5,960 feet, the average depth about 6 feet. The soil is very light and easily dug. It will run through four farms, and two of the owners will not consent to have the work done for the reason they say that the next freshet will ruin all their land lying between the ditch and river. Probably it would change the course of the river and make islands of these lands, which are very valuable. Should heavy rains come on shortly, this work would not be required, for the springs would then be full, as well as the river, and sufficient water would flow through the pond to keep it pure and sweet. The offensive smell of the pond has been occasioned more from the sinks than the drought. These sinks have all been removed and large, deep vaults have been dug, which do not communicate with the pond excepting the little that sinks through the soil. This pond can be drained, or nearly so, by digging a small ditch to the river below it, but the surgeon is of the opinion that this would not answer. To let water into this camp from the city waterworks will be expensive and of no use at this season, for, owing to the want of rain, these waterworks cannot supply the inhabitants with water. The length of pipe to be laid to bring the water to the prisoners' camp will be about one mile and the cost about $5,000. The camp is now well supplied with excellent well water for cooking and drinking, and the river supplies for washing and bathing. There are seven wells completed and a pump in each. Two more are to be made. These wells require to be dug only from 15 to 22 feet in depth. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, S. Eastman, Lieutenant Colonel, USA Commanding Depot, Washington, D.C., October 23, 1864. Colonel B.F. Tracy, Commanding Depot, Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York. Colonel, your letter of the 17th reporting the prevalence of disease among the prisoners owing to the existence in the camp of a stagnant pond of water is received. The suggestion made by you that a pipe be laid to conduct the water from the river above into the pond within the enclosure with a view to remove the material exhalations from the stagnant water is approved and will be carried into immediate effect if the soil through which the ditch is to be dug is of a character to be readily excavated and there are no other obstacles. All of the labor must be performed by the prisoners and the cost must be paid out of the prison fund. The pipe will be constructed of two inch plank, the opening to be six inches square, the joints to be well pitched to prevent leaking. To unite the several lengths of pipe, let the end of one be beveled off five or six inches while the other is made flaring so that one may be forced into the other to make a closed joint. Constructed in this way, the whole work should not cost over $120. Make inquiries in relation to the work in all its particulars and report to me before it is commenced. What time will it require to complete it? How many prisoners can you safely employ on it at a time? Where will you obtain the necessary tools, etc.? The fall rains may be expected to come on very soon which for this winter will do away with the necessity for the work. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, W. Hoffman, Colonel 3rd Infantry and Commanding General of Prisoners. Headquarters Depot for Prisoners of War, Elmira, New York, October 26th, 1864. Colonel William Hoffman, Commander General, Prisoners of War. Colonel, I have the honor to submit the following facts in reference to the laying of pipe to conduct the water from the river above the prison camp into the pond within the enclosure, as required in yours of the 23rd. The material to be excavated is very light soil and easily accomplished. 125 to 150 prisoners can be employed with safety. The quartermaster has on hand that can be used a large supply of tools, nearly if not wholly sufficient to perform the work. A limited number may have to be purchased. The whole work can be completed in from 12 to 15 days from its commencement. I am making preparations and shall commence the work immediately 
unless otherwise ordered by telegram. I am Colonel, very respectfully, your obedient servant, B.F. Tracy, Colonel, Commanding Depot. Under date of January 1st, 1865, the following endorsement is made on an inspection report. I have the honor to report that the conduit for conducting a stream of water from the Shemung River through the prison camp is fully completed and works like a charm. It proves, however, to have been a more serious job than was anticipated, owing to waste and quicksand in the bottom of the cutting. Through a considerable portion of the cutting, we struck the coarse gravel of what seems to have been the river's bottom. Through this, the water ran quite freely, compelling us to use the pump extensively. Quicksand was also found in places. It is at last completed at a cost, aside from the labor of prisoners, of $2,000, but it is worth twice its cost. Respectfully referred to the Commissioner General of Prisoners, B.F. Tracy, Colonel, Commanding Depot. This official correspondence goes to show that Lieutenant Colonel Eastman had fully outlined the necessities of the case to the department as early as August 21st and was ready to proceed at once. That was the time when the relief was sadly needed. For some unaccountable reason, the matter hung fire in Washington till October 17th, when Colonel Tracy prods the Commissioner General of Prisoners, and finally on October 26th, tells him that unless stopped, he shall begin work at once. Evidently, he did begin very soon, as on November 13th, Colonel Tracy says, quote, The ditch has been commenced and is progressing, which when completed will remove one of the most intolerable nuisances the camp is subject to, end quote. Again on November 20th, he reports, quote, The conduit is progressing finally. 125 prisoners are employed eight hours per day on its excavation. It is rather more than half completed. There have been 3,000 feet of the ditch dug and 1,000 feet of wooden pipe laid and covered, end quote. The concrete story of the ditch is gathered from the official evidence and the recollection of officers and residents is substantially as follows. The ditch from the upper or west end of Foster's Pond to connect with the river ran in a westerly direction about 15 degrees south and reached the river 5,960 feet from the place of beginning. The river had a southerly bend at this point, so that the current running in a straight line at the point of junction was directly in the line of the ditch. The only allusion in the advertiser which might pertain to this ditch is the following on November 16th, beginning quote. The quartermaster has authority to buy as many tools as prisoners of war may need in their mechanical labor to be paid for out of the prison fund, end quote. The excavation varied from 6 to 7 feet in depth and was made large enough to contain a pipe 8 inches square on the outside. This pipe was made from 2 inch plank, giving an inside capacity of 6 inches square. The method of making and joining is described in the official correspondence. Colonel Tracy's remark in his letter about the coarse gravel, like that in the riverbed, suggests the idea that once upon a time the course of the river was down this same line, and that Foster's Pond was once a part of the natural river current. This would give a reasonable explanation of the origin of Foster's Pond. Back beyond the memory of knowledge of the oldest inhabitant, the current of the river may have run in this direction. The natural lay of the land would indicate the possibility. At some time of a flood, the river cut a new channel, and this old one filled up down to Foster's Pond, which remained. After the fill, the pond was supplied through the old channel, although covered. This possibility has a parallel. A long time ago, Hoffman Creek ran down through the center of the city, crossing Market Street under the building now owned and occupied by the Elks, running diagonally across the street under the building now occupied by the Mohegan Grocery. This old creek bed was discovered in 1889 when excavating the cellar under the old advertiser building, known in war times as the Hathaway House. Whenever there was a flood, the water would run freely through this old creek bed, to such an extent as to prevent the erection of a large building, such as was contemplated when the discovery was made. The author believes that this theory as to Foster's Pond is the correct one, and that the river once coursed through the pond. He also believes that the pond is now fed by the seepage of water through the old channel, instead of from live springs as many have supposed. The ditch was dug by a force of 125 prisoners and must have been 
begun between November 1st and the 10th, and completed before December 1st. Mr. Thad C. Moore, son of the late Colonel Stephen Moore, in command of the Provisional Brigade guarding the prison camp, was at that time a bright, wide-awake boy, on the job, every minute as boys of 15 always are. The family lived in the Colonel's quarters just outside the prison camp, and Thad was all over the place, whenever and wherever anything was going on. He remembers distinctly the digging of the ditch, and says that the prisoners were orderly and worked faithfully. They were well fed, and every day after work was ended, the men were marched up in front of the colonel's quarters, and a tin cup of whiskey, liberal measure, was given to each man in the gang. The ditch tapped the river about midway of the rifts, and the fall toward the pond was sufficient to produce a swift current in the sluice box, which made it a great success. It was found soon after that the opening, previously made between the lower end of the pond and the river, was not large enough to take care of the influx of water, so a large force of men was at once set to work enlarging the lower channel so that the current might be free. No further complaint was made about the condition of the pond, as the large amount of fresh water coming in kept the pond thoroughly purified. During August and September much had been said about the terrible condition of the pond. The intense heat had much to do with this condition, and while it must be admitted that had the pond been a running stream during those months, things would have been better, no blame can attach to the officers of the camp because it was not. The emergency came on suddenly in the midst of the hottest weather of the year. In the time of exceptional drought, and the necessary time consumed in obtaining permission from Washington to undertake so large a task made it seem very slow. Had the summer been normal, little trouble would have been experienced. As it was, it is a grave question as to whether this factor did or did not have a material bearing on the death rate. There were so many other serious conditions to contend with that the death rate was bound to be excessive. The following data taken from the advertiser gives us a fair idea of the weather conditions. July 8th, dry season, water very low, city water works have given out. July 21st, great scarcity of water. Those who possess the deepest wells may congratulate themselves as many wells are dry. July 26th, had a good rain today, relieved the drought somewhat. Very hot and dry on August 1st, soil void of moisture for a foot or more, hottest day in 28 years. August 3rd, good rain, which permits waterworks to supply water again. August 16th, John Mitchell gives notice of his inability to sprinkle streets on account of scarcity of water. August 29th, copious rains noted. The average temperature in July and August was the highest in many years. A severe drought prevailed during the entire summer to such an extent that the hay crop was almost a failure and the yield of potatoes and other vegetables was not half that of ordinary years. These points are verified in the letters of Honorable R. R. Moss and others. This drought had a very important bearing on the quality of the beef furnished, as well as the quantity of vegetables, and is referred to in subsequent chapters concerning food.